we could be on a big fat bubble and if that bubble crashes it's a problem the word bubble remember the word bubble you heard it here first I mean I don't want to sound rude but I hope if it explodes it's going to be now rather than two months into another administration because honestly you got yourself problems the word bubble remember the word bubble you heard it here first love him or hate him there's one thing nobody can deny Donald Trump knows a lot about the US economy he's part of the one percent running this country and has built a multi-billion dollar fortune so is the Republican frontrunner full of hot air again or is this a slip of the tongue from somebody who knows more than he's willing to share with the rest of us the answer to this question will shock even hardcore liberals my name is Charles Hayek and I'm a retired economics professor most of my life I've studied macroeconomics and the cycles of boom and bust in the global economy what I can promise you right now is if you give me just 10 minutes of your time you will understand more about our economy than many Harvard graduates in my research I have uncovered a strange pattern that has been going on for the past 20 years a bizarre economic cycle intimately linked to every US election since then right now I will show you the hard facts that led me to this conclusion in plain and simple English so that by the end of this video you can make your own choice and be better prepared for what's to come but to understand how this bizarre pattern works we need to take a short look back at 1999 when the ball drops on the year 2000 it will be a momentous event for the world and for the US economy which is closing in on its longest expansion ever the decade has been marked by strong growth the lowest unemployment in a generation and yet remarkably little inflation it seemed like a totally different America than the one we are living in today the stock market was booming thanks to the internet companies affectionately called the dot-coms for many Americans investing in the internet companies seemed like the quickest way to become rich more and more people put their savings into the stock market driving it higher and higher they gambled their money on the hope that they could sell those stocks for two to three times their value and everybody was praising the Clinton administration for creating the biggest economic growth in US history for a time it worked to many it seemed like the party would never end even the chairman of the Federal Reserve Alan Greenspan said technology is creating a new economy one where the old rules no longer applied the Fed was so confident that in February 2000 it began raising the interest rates to their highest level since 1995 at the same time bad economic data started to come in the previous holiday season that was supposed to bring big profits to internet based companies was a major disappointment and it was not just online shopping ordinary Americans bought less and consumption was dropping while the nation was preparing for the next election the house of cards built around the stock market started to collapse on the 12th of April 2000 the Nasdaq dropped by 386 points it was the largest drop ever recorded and by the end of the next week Wall Street had lost almost a quarter of its value the long economic boom of the late 90s became a gigantic bust Bush was entering office at a time when the Nasdaq had lost 60 percent of its value erasing seven trillion dollars of American wealth Clinton's economy grew on the back of the dot-com bubble and now everybody was looking to Bush to get the economy going again but before going any further let's take a short step back and see what we can learn from this an economic bubble grows around an asset that becomes very attractive to investors in the 90s this asset was the internet company stock greed attracts more and more people who gamble their money hoping that prices will go up and they will sell for a profit later when people are blinded by the bubble they think that growth will never end this delusion is fueled by the media economic experts and even the Fed at this point something very interesting happened as the economy showed signs of slowing down the Fed raised the interest rate and curiously some months before the next US election the bubble bursts creating massive economic pain we now have a theory that we can put to the test a bubble emerges and grows on low interest rates investors and speculators are down in as the experts say 
Everything is fine and growth will continue. The Fed raises interest rates in a time where the economy begins to slow down. And that specific time is right before the next presidential election. The bubble bursts and the next president has to deal with the aftermath. If this sounds crazy to you right now, let's put the theory to the test. I do believe in the American dream. I believe there is such a thing as the American dream. Owning a home is a part of that dream. It just is. Right here in America, if you own your own home, uh, you're realizing the American dream. The asset this time was houses. The Federal Reserve had cut interest rates from 6% in 2001 to 1% 1 in 2003. Rock bottom interest rates created a huge demand for mortgages as they were cheaper to pay off. Everybody wanted a house and that pushed prices up. You could get rich just by becoming a homeowner as the price kept going up. Soon, even people who could not afford to make a down payment or could not provide proof of a steady income and collateral were given loans to purchase new homes. If these people defaulted on their payments, the bankers didn't care. They would be left with a house, an asset that was rising in price. These no down payment, no collateral mortgage loans, called subprime mortgages, were given to millions of low-income families. If, and one of the barriers to home ownership is the inability to make a down payment. And if one of the goals is to increase home ownership, it makes sense to help people pay that down payment. Now, the bankers had a brilliant idea. Bundle up the normal mortgages with the subprime ones and sell them to other banks, pension funds, hedge funds, and sovereign funds. Mortgage payments generated huge profits and demand was high for this new type of speculative contract now called collateralized debt obligations or CDOs. This created the housing bubble. Uh, ben, there's been a lot of talk about a housing bubble, particularly you know, from the Fed, from all sorts of, of uh, uh, different places. Can you give us your view as to whether or not there is a housing bubble out there? Well, unquestionably, housing prices are up quite a bit. I think it's important to note that uh, fundamentals are also very strong. We've got a, a growing economy, uh, jobs, incomes. We've got very low mortgage rates. The experts appeared all over mainstream news, assuring everyone that housing was not a bubble. Wealth has risen dramatically. The United States economy has never been better shape. There is no tax increase coming in the next couple of years. Monetary policy is spectacular. The Federal Reserve now started to increase interest rates. By 2007, the interest rates had reached five and a quarter percent, and many families with subprime mortgages could not afford to make the monthly payments, and their homes were foreclosed. As more and more houses went up for sale, the prices started dropping. Consumption plummeted. A new crisis had begun, and it would reach its peak in fall 2008, right before the elections. House prices tanked. Banks and other investment funds found that their bulletproof, high-profit CDOs became worthless. No one wanted to buy CDOs or houses anymore. It was a financial bloodbath. The banking giant, Lehman Brothers, had bet on mortgages and was left holding assets nobody wanted anymore. On the 15th of September, it filed for bankruptcy. During November 2008, Americans lost more than a quarter of their collective net worth. U.S. stocks were down by 45% from its 2007 high. Housing prices had dropped 20% from their 2006 peak. Total U.S. household wealth went down by $14 trillion. Through the banking giant Citicorp, Bank of America, J.P. Morgan, and Goldman Sachs, the big traders of CDOs, the crisis had spread to the world. And now, stocks and property values plummeted everywhere. The economy of the world entered a deep recession. All this happened as our nation was preparing to choose its 44th president. The housing bubble burst two months before the election. So how does our theory stand? We had a new housing and subprime mortgage bubble created by low interest rates. Many Americans thought housing was a secure investment. The banks gambled huge sums of money on CDOs. The experts, again, said everything was fine. The economy started to weaken in late 2007 as the Fed was increasing the interest rates. The bubble violently burst just as Americans were preparing to vote for the 44th president of the United States. Everything that happened in 2000 happened again in 2008. 
the bubble burst in the year of the elections. Only this time, it was bigger, and the damage was global and massive. The theory is proven correct again. There's an election coming this November. Will there be another economic crisis? Let's go through our checklist again. In December 2015, the Fed started to increase interest rates. For the past five years, the rate has been close to 0%. The economy is already showing signs of slowing down. Right now, the Bloomberg Commodity Index hit a 16-year low. The last time this happened was August 2008. Commodities represent all the goods being traded around the world. Everything from oil to coffee, sugar, steel, and copper. When their price slumps, it signals a slowdown in the world economy. Oil is reaching its 2008 low point. The last time the price of oil was this low, the global financial system was melting down. And this time, it will hit the U.S. economy much harder because of the shale miracle. CNBC's Jim Cramer is warning that many U.S. oil companies will become bankrupt if the price of oil remains this low. The price of copper, too, has plunged all the way down to $2. The last time it was this low was just before the stock market crash of 2008. Consumption is slowing down. U.S. imports of goods declined by 6.6% on a year-over-year -year basis. U.S. exports of goods declined by 10.4% on a year-over-year -year basis. 2015 was the worst year for holiday spending since 2008. U.S. manufacturing is contracting at the fastest pace that we have seen since the last recession. If just one or two of these indicators were flashing red, that would be bad enough. The fact that all of them seem to be saying the exact same thing tells us that big trouble is ahead. So what are the experts saying? What do you see right now? Actually, the, the economy is fundamentally strong. Housing is booming. Uh, technology is booming. Commercial real estate is booming. In all fairness to Obama, during his administration in the last few years, jobs have been created and the jobless rate is way down. If you just kept it simple, you'd say that the United States is growing almost at <coughs> kind of a trend growth, you know, whether it's two and a half or just under three percent growth or maybe even a little above it. Well, no, no, but around trend growth. Following our checklist, we have an election year, the Fed raising interest rates, an economy slowing down, experts saying everything is fine. The only thing that's missing is the bubble that Trump warned will burst before the November elections. Does he know something we don't? The word bubble, remember the word bubble, you heard it here first. I mean, I don't want to sound rude, but I hope if it explodes, it's going to be now rather than two months into another administration. Well, to understand exactly what a bubble is, we need to look back at the dot-com and the mortgage CDO bubbles. In both cases, people thought that they had something that would never stop growing, something too big to fail. In both cases, stocks and housing attracted huge sums of money driving their prices way beyond the actual value. This is just like gambling. Buyers get the asset, hoping they will sell it in the future for a profit. When the bubble bursts, those who are left with the asset suffer huge losses. Right now, I must ask you to give me your full attention. The following five minutes will be shocking and a little bit tricky to understand. And I hope you're sitting down for this. My prediction for 2016 is that we will see a banking collapse that will make the 2008 crisis look like a Sunday afternoon picnic. This coming crash will wipe out the entire U.S. financial sector and take with it savings, deposits, retirement funds, pensions. It'll be nothing short of a financial bloodbath. How can this be possible? Well, remember how bubbles are created when something seems to grow indefinitely? The delusion is that something is too big to fail. But the bigger the bubble becomes, the faster it fails. Right now, people think big banks can't fail because of their size and importance in the world economy. It is as blatant as their name suggests. How did we get here? On September 18, 2008, Hank Paulson, the U.S. Secretary of the Treasury, told members of Congress that $5.5 trillion in wealth would disappear by 2 p.m. that day unless the government took immediate action. What took place next was undoubtedly the biggest blackmail in history. The threat, keep the big banks alive or else the economy implodes and depositors lose their money. In December 2008, 
the first of many financial stability measures was put into place. The Fed's mission from now on was to keep the big banks alive no matter what. Economists calculated that the total cost of the various measures put into place to accommodate big banks was in excess of $20 trillion up to this year. The too big to fail banks now had a taxpayer sponsored safety net. The message was clear do whatever risky business you want. We've got your back. And this is how Congress and the Federal Reserve created the ultimate bubble the too big to fail bubble. The idea that the too big to fails were going to get cut down to size after the financial crisis has turned into a giant myth. In fact, they've become even bigger. J.P. Morgan Chase, number one among banks in total assets, has seen its base swell to more than $2.5 trillion. The company's deposit base alone has grown by 29% since the end of 2008. The so-called Big Four institutions, J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, Citigroup, and Wells Fargo, continue to distance themselves from the pack with some $8.2 trillion in total assets. That's 154% more than the rest of the top 50 banks combined. Unfortunately, the old saying, the bigger they are, the harder they fall, will prove correct. And when they collapse, the result will be nothing short of catastrophic for the world economy. But for a bubble to inflate, you also need an asset on which speculation, or rather gambling, has become so rampant and so over the top that a disaster is just waiting to happen. Let me introduce you to the world's biggest and most dangerous casino. It's called the derivatives market. And right now, the total net worth of all outstanding derivatives contracts is a staggering $552.9 trillion, according to the Bank for International Settlements. $552.9 trillion. Let that number sink in for a moment. Total U.S. debt right now stands close to $19 trillion, and most Americans find that shocking. But very few have any idea of how big this financial market is. The entire economy of the world, in real goods and services, is evaluated at around $78 trillion annually. The derivative market is seven times the value of every good and every service provided around the world in an entire year. At first, I thought this number was too big to be real. But the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, Independent Bureau of the U.S. Department of the Treasury, confirms it. Make no mistake, you are looking at the biggest bubble in the history of mankind something seven times greater than the entire economy of the world. So what exactly is a derivative? A derivative is a speculative contract, a bet placed on stocks, mortgages, interest rates, the price of commodities like gold, silver, coffee, oil, or the possibility of a company or even a nation to default. Basically, right now, there is nothing of economic worth that does not have some sort of derivative attached to it. All derivatives are bets. This is not a metaphor, an analogy, or a generalization. The players on the derivative market gamble trillions on the future price of the asset to which the derivative is attached. These are the speculative contracts that will eventually pop the current gigantic bubble. Warren Buffett once referred to derivatives as financial weapons of mass destruction, and he was proven right. The CDOs that led to the crash of 2008 were derivatives as they drew their value from interest payments on mortgages and housing prices. They were traded on this market just like all the other derivatives, and they were just a tiny part of the market. In 2008, there were about $500 billion worth of CDOs. That was only a very tiny fraction of the derivatives market, yet it was enough to almost collapse the economy of the world. Remember how I said that this is the world's largest casino? In a nutshell, the derivatives market, or more correctly put, the derivatives casino, is where big banks and other financial institutions place their bets on every aspect of the world economy. Yet with these bets, everybody loses. So how did this bubble inflate to more than $550 trillion? Say Jack controls the derivative department of one of the too big to fail banks. He knows that the riskier the bet, the higher the profit he gets, and the bigger his bonus. And he thinks, just like everyone else, that if he loses, the Federal Reserve will bail him out just like in 2008. 
What do you think Jack would do? How much do you think Jack would bet on derivatives? Well, the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency has the exact numbers. Citigroup, total assets more than $1.8 trillion. Total exposure to derivatives, more than $53 trillion. J.P. Morgan Chase, total assets, about $2.4 trillion. Total exposure to derivatives, more than $51 trillion. Goldman Sachs, total assets, less than a trillion dollars. Total exposure to derivatives, more than $51 trillion. Bank of America, total assets, a little bit more than $2.1 trillion. Total exposure to derivatives, more than $45 trillion. Morgan Stanley, total assets, less than a trillion dollars. Total exposure to derivatives, more than $31 trillion. Overall, the biggest U.S. banks collectively have more than $247 trillion of exposure to derivatives contracts. This is an amount of money that is more than 13 times the size of the U.S. national debt. And it's a ticking time bomb that could set off financial Armageddon at any moment. This is gambling on the future of the world economy on an unprecedented scale. And just like every other bubble before it, the too-big-to-fail derivatives bubble will burst. The bubble to end all bubbles. Because of its sheer size, it's inflated to a size far greater than the dot-com bubble and the mortgage CDO bubble combined. This is the final piece of the puzzle. The Fed interest rate hike, the experts claiming everything is okay, the real economy slowing down, and the bubble that is inflated to an unsustainable size. If history repeats itself, 2016 will be the year big banks come crashing down, and the Fed and our government are totally powerless to stop them. Their safety net is made out of straws. It took extraordinary efforts to prop up the big banks in 2008. During Obama's presidency, the U.S. debt doubled, reaching almost $19 trillion. Yet the economy grew at a modest pace of 2% per year. Compare that to the doubling of the derivatives market, and you begin to realize the level of economic pain we are about to feel. This will make the Great Depression of the 30s and the Great Recession of 2008 feel like a picnic. So what would a crash look like? You need only to picture what happened in Greece to get an idea. The first thing that happened is that all the banks closed. The only way people could get their money out was with ATM withdrawals. And they were limited to 60 euros a day. That's about $63. Ask yourself this. If the banks close in the U.S., could you live with $63 per day? Immediately, huge lines formed in front of ATMs. People waited in the scorching heat for hours to get a tiny fraction of their savings and deposits out. 17% of the Greek population is currently unable to meet their daily needs for food. Approximately 30% are living below the poverty line. The official unemployment rate is 27%, 52% of under 25s. In Athens, Greece's capital, one of these is 53-year-old Athenian Vasilis Demopoulos who used to earn up to 3,000 euros per month until his employer folded in 2008. I sold my home in 2007, though the small profit I made is now gone. I was on the streets for six months, he said. Now, Demopoulos lives in a Red Cross hostel selling Athens street paper, Shadia. Dionysia McAladu, retiree. I have no insurance. I have no pension. I have nothing. Since the crisis, Suicides have increased by roughly 50%. Emmy Christoulis, daughter of suicide victim. If one Greek was to take up a Kalashnikov, I would be the second. I find no other solution than that of a dignified exit before I begin searching through the garbage for my food. I believe that one day, because the younger generation has no future, they will take up arms and hang the traitors of the nation. Keep in mind that Greece received bailouts in 2015. And yet, this is the situation there. Who will be able to bail out the world's largest economy? No one. The crisis brought by the collapse of the too-big-to-fail banks will be global, and it will dwarf anything the world has ever seen. Personally, I expect that everything that happened in Greece will happen in the U.S. 
but on a much greater scale. And the impacts will be far worse. I have studied economics for the past 35 years. I have seen it go through good times, and I have studied the bad ones. I went through the numbers over and over again, thinking this is not real, thinking I had made a mistake somewhere. But many other economic experts say the same thing. The same experts who warned us about the crisis coming in 2008 are all sounding the alarm bells. Peter Schiff, Gerald Salenti, Mark Faber, and many others are predicting a disaster for 2016. To be completely honest with you, I'm afraid for my future and the future of my family. I knew I had to do something to prepare for the worst economic crisis in our lifetime. But where to start and what to do? While doing my research for this presentation, I discovered what Americans did during the last three financial meltdowns, which strategies worked, and which condemned hundreds of thousands to poverty. If this presentation made any sense to you, if you have begun to understand the economic gun that's pointed at the head of every U.S. citizen, then you need to take the following information very seriously. The first aim of this project was to warn people, just like you, of the imminent danger looming over our country. The second aim of this project is sharing my research on the last three financial meltdowns with as many people as possible. Let me tell you right off the bat, there are two mistakes 89% of Americans make right now that during the crash will cost them their wealth, their retirement funds, their deposits, and their savings. And there are two very simple solutions that require just five minutes to put into place in order to avoid financial ruin. But before sharing this with you, I must ask for your help. Here's why. I've gathered all my research on economic collapses that have happened around the world and created a blueprint designed to help Americans to survive and thrive during the coming big bank derivatives. I called my work Surviving the Final Bubble, and I've managed to deliver it to over 1,000 families through the Internet. And I did it without charging them a single cent. Unfortunately, Keeping the website up and running and sending the message across is not cheap. I dedicated $10,000 of our savings to do this, and it was all gone by January 3rd. The only reason you are seeing this presentation right now is because I started to give away surviving the final bubble at a cost. I crunched the numbers, and in order to keep this website alive, we need to get back $37 for every copy delivered. It is only through the contributions of other like-minded, responsible Americans that you are seeing this presentation right now. Over 3,000 people have read the book, discovered the vital information on wealth protection and crisis survival, and contributed to our project. Here's a short summary of what you will discover inside. Why the government is not your friend when safeguarding your wealth during an economic meltdown. Just to give you an example, during the crisis in Cyprus in 2012, Deposits were confiscated to prop up the banks. But they can't take what they don't know you have. There are three assets you do not have to report to the U.S. government, and I will show you how to use them to protect your wealth and financial stability. There are two types of stocks that positively skyrocket when the rest of the market comes crashing down. The harder Wall Street bleeds, the more valuable this investment becomes, as everybody scrambles to get a slice of these types of companies. I will tell you the best moment to buy and when you can cash in safely. There's one item that during an economic crash becomes a real godsend. That's because it's easier to barter with, to store, and its price usually skyrockets. I will show you exactly why owning it means seizing an opportunity that may end all your financial worries and where to get it to avoid scammers. This is just a small sample of what you can discover inside. So, I mentioned two mistakes that will wipe out trillions during the coming collapse. First, 89% of Americans are not aware of something very serious. When you put your money in the bank, you have legally transferred your deposit to the bank. You have become the creditor, and the bank is the debtor. The bank owes you the money. When you demand payment, the bank is obligated to give you your money back. However, if the bank becomes insolvent prior to you taking your money out of the bank, they will not have to give you your money back. All of your money will simply vanish. Secondly, if you own stocks, sell them. Get out of the stock market. Stocks are the absolute worst place to keep your money if an economic crash happens. Your money will be wiped out in the blink of an eye. 
We've seen this happen in 1929, 2000, and 2008. The stock market crash has already started, and it will only accelerate as the election draws near. This information is designed to help you thrive during the big bank derivatives collapse if it does not spin completely out of control. Up to this point, we have only talked about wealth protection, but it might not be enough. Given the size of the derivatives market and the wild speculation going on, securing wealth and financial stability may be very low on the priority list for any family. Food, water, safety, and keeping illness and criminals away may be a far more pressing concern. Make no mistake, this disaster will be global. There will be no place to run to for safe haven. And that's when, by chance, I met Mark Baker. To some, Mark may seem a somewhat eccentric because of his passion and dedication to survival and disaster preparedness. His dedication goes way further than reading books, attending seminars, and learning from the experts. He likes to test everything he's learned in real-life conditions. That's why he went to Greece and to Venezuela during the worst time of the economic disaster that hit both countries. During a five-month period, he stayed with Greek and Venezuelan families in the most impoverished areas, learning how an economic crisis impacts their daily lives and trying to help them out, all while putting his survival knowledge to the test. And he decided he would live there on a $300 budget for the entire trip. His conclusion? A lot of the information provided by survival gurus out there has nothing to do with real life and can be downright dangerous. A lot of these survival experts with their Amazon bestseller books are sitting behind their computer imagining how an economic collapse will happen and write about unproven, rehashed solutions. Strategies that sound good in theory, but completely unproven in a collapse. Fortunately, nothing beats hands-on, hard-earned knowledge. His experience in both countries was eye-opening, to say the least. He went through a food shortage, blackouts, riots. He learned how to be safe from criminals when the police simply didn't interfere, and how to barter for supplies. He saw how real families managed to keep their spirits up in even the most desperate times, and how to cope with illness and injury while the hospitals are out of supplies understaffed, or flooded by wounded from riots. And yes, he went through a lot of hardships, pain, and suffering to discover how to survive and to thrive in the collapse. After telling me about his personal experience, we talked about problems that arise in an economic collapse and how to solve them. Surviving an economic crisis is one thing. Thriving and securing your wealth during it is a totally different game. So, we put our knowledge together and created an economic disaster survival blueprint for our families that would handle both wealth protection and crisis survival. Mark's hard-earned skills will guide you through in what we call the worst-case scenario section. Inside Mark's comprehensive section on economic survival, you will discover how to have consistent, nutritious, and long-lasting food stores in a crisis by storing food and water without alerting anyone. Following these first few crucial steps will guarantee that you and your family won't be left at the mercy of others for the most basic human needs. In Greece, even some middle-class people with respectable jobs wound up digging through trash or stood in lines for hours for humanitarian handouts. You want to do everything in your power to avoid that, and we will show you how. Twelve skills vital during the coming collapse. All of these essential skills were selected by Mark based on his experience in Greece. When the services we've come to rely on are no longer available, and when having cash becomes just paper, you want to have something valuable to trade other than your supplies. You will be safer knowing you always have valuable knowledge to offer in exchange for whatever you might need. Unfortunately, because of their stature and frailness, Children and senior citizens are the weakest links in disastrous situations like these. But that doesn't have to be the case anymore, because we will show you a couple of essential tips to ensure their safety and well-being at all times. You will discover the secrets on how to build strong links within the community and how to become its leader. There's always safety and conform in numbers, and you will find out how to build a cohesive group and how to manage dangerous situations. 
This is just a brief glimpse on our comprehensive guide to surviving and thriving during the coming financial meltdown. Here's my promise to you. Should this worst case scenario happen, if you follow the information inside, you'll never have to beg, borrow, or steal just to feed your family or clothe your children or to not have to live in unsanitary conditions during any crisis. But that's not all you're getting when you choose to contribute to our project because you will also receive two bonuses that complement surviving the final bubble in every way. The first one is called survival mindset. During a crisis, many have lost their lives because they succumb to emotional stress first. This guide is dedicated to showing you all the secrets to overcoming the powerful emotions that can overcome even the most seasoned survivalist during a disaster. In Chapter 1, you will discover the simple blueprint to coping with the emotional stress that can ruin even the most carefully put together survival plan. You will learn the simple remedies for the most crippling emotional states, isolation, anxiety and hopelessness, and many others. This knowledge will keep you and every member of your group confident, disciplined, and steadfast, and will maximize your chances of survival, how to keep morale up, and how to maintain a positive attitude. Using this information, you will easily become a true leader of the community. The second focuses on hygiene and sanitary conditions during the shortages that come with any disaster. Secrets to Sanitization After SHTF is designed to show you how to be safe from disease by using survival techniques to dispose of potentially harmful waste and garbage, how to efficiently use limited hygiene supplies to maximize their effectiveness. You will also discover how to prioritize hygiene needs during a disaster. Valuable resources must always be kept for high-priority sanitization needs and not squandered on petty ones. These bonuses are available absolutely free with your copy of Surviving the Final Bubble and support this website today. But we want to go even further than that. Just say maybe to the Surviving the Final Bubble program click and the Get Instant Access button. Fill out your information on the Secured Payment Processor page and go through the program and the bonuses for a full 60-day trial. And if you have any reason for being unhappy with your investment, you will get a refund in as little as 48 hours, no questions asked. It's as simple as that, and you risk nothing. It will be hard to find a better proposition than this. Frankly, the way things are going, I would be surprised if the first major shocks to the economic system don't happen by the end of your trial period. When the unthinkable happens, roles in society are reversed. Being able to read fancy spreadsheets might be useful today, but in a crashing society, it will put you at the bottom of the food chain. Adaptability, strength, and the knowledge you are about to receive are the only things that will get you and your family through. It's time for you to make a choice. It may be the most important one you will ever make. There are three possible paths ahead of you. Path one, you don't do anything. You go on with your daily life and pray for a miracle, or that any of the data presented above is fake or misinterpreted. You can trust Obama, Janet Yellen, Ben Bernanke, when they all say everything is fine. But that's exactly what all the talking heads on TV and all the politicians said back in 2008. But this time, you know it's different. The bubble is much, much bigger, and the Fed is out of ammo. They have printed too much money already, and they have kept interest rates low for too long. There is no way out. No one to bail out the too-big-to-fail banks or the government. Over the past eight years, we have doubled our debt, while the real economy, not Wall Street, hasn't even fully recovered from the last bubble. These are the undeniable facts of our time. I strongly urge you not to remain passive. Remember the suffering of Greece. It will all come to America soon. It will happen right before your eyes. Mark heard firsthand the cries of children, tears of hunger pain streaming down their faces. Don't let the same happen to your family. That is the result of doing nothing, of being unprepared. I hate to ask you this, but would you be able to live with yourself knowing you had one good solution in hand, one click away, completely risk-free? Unfortunately, this is the kind of attitude most of the Americans will cling to. But I get it. Ignorance is bliss. Ignorance is much more comfortable than being a true man and an upstanding American citizen and taking action right now. Path number two. 
prepare and learn everything by yourself. Like I said earlier, I've spent countless nights thinking about the best ways to protect my family. But sure, if you really want to, it could be a viable option. But keep this in mind. You've never been through an actual economic collapse. You don't have the skills specifically tailored for this kind of disaster. Should you choose one of these paths, we wish you the best of luck and pray that you too will make it. Path number three, get instant access to the Surviving the Final Bubble program now. A risk-free, worry-free program with a treasure trove of knowledge to help you thrive and prosper during the economic collapse. Allow yourself and your family to have the peace of mind that comes when you know you have done everything in your power to keep them safe. You have to realize that the consequences of an economic collapse will not be the same as if there's a terrorist attack or food crisis or grid attack. What will be happening in the following months is something that Americans have never experienced before. The closest we've ever come is the Great Depression. And yet, while things were bad, society and the government survived. And with no middle class to fund anything, with no jobs, no economy, and a government that is already tens of trillions of dollars in debt, you and your family will be completely on your own. Unless, that is, you have the ease to take the actionable steps included in the program. In which case, you can have an entire proven survival plan in place in less than 14 days from now without spending more than $100 in expenses. You can be one of the smart Americans who understand something amazing when they see it, who goes through the program. Feel your worries and anxiety melt away. All the while contributing to this project and helping many American families, just like yours, survive and thrive during the greatest bubble in the history of mankind. The choice should be obvious, but it's up to you to take the final step. God bless you, and God bless America. As the economy showed signs of slowing down, the Fed raised the interest rate. And, curiously, some months before the next U.S. election, the bubble bursts, creating massive economic pain. We now have a theory that we can put to the test. A bubble emerges and grows on low interest rates. Investors and speculators are down in, as the experts say. Everything is fine and growth will continue. The Fed raises interest rates in a time where the economy begins to slow down. And that specific time is right before the next presidential election. The bubble bursts and the next president has to deal with the aftermath. If this sounds crazy to you right now, Let's put the theory to the test. I do believe in the American dream. I believe there is such a thing as the American dream. Owning a home is a part of that dream. It just is. Right here in America, if you own your own home, uh, you're realizing the American dream. The asset this time was houses. The Federal Reserve had cut interest rates from 6% in 2001 to 1% 1 in 2003. Rock-bottom interest rates created a huge demand for mortgages, as they were cheaper to pay off. Everybody wanted a house, and that pushed prices up. You could get rich just by becoming a homeowner, as the price kept going up. Soon, even people who could not afford to make a down payment or bring big profits to Internet-based companies was a major disappointment. And it was not just online shopping. Ordinary Americans bought less, and consumption was dropping. While the nation was preparing for the next election, the house of cards built around the stock market started to collapse. On the 12th of April, 2000, the NASDAQ dropped by 386 points. It was the largest drop ever recorded, and by the end of the next week, Wall Street had lost almost a quarter of its value. The long economic boom of the late 90s became a gigantic bust. Bush was entering office at a time when the Nasdaq had lost 60% of its value, erasing $7 trillion of American wealth. Clinton's economy grew on the back of the dot-com bubble, and now everybody was looking to Bush to get the economy going again. But before going any further, let's take a short step back and see what we can learn from this. An economic bubble grows around an asset that becomes very attractive to investors. In the 90s, this asset was the Internet company stock. Greed attracts more and more people 
who gamble their money, hoping that prices will go up and they will sell for a profit later. When people are blinded by the bubble, they think that growth will never end. This delusion is fueled by the media, economic experts, and even the Fed. At this point, something very interesting happened. As we could not provide proof of a steady income and collateral, were given loans to purchase new homes. If these people defaulted on their payments, the bankers didn't care. They would be left with a house, an asset that was rising in price. These no-down payment, no-collateral mortgage loans, called subprime mortgages, were given to millions of low-income families. And one of the barriers to home ownership is the inability to make a down payment. And if one of the goals is to increase home ownership, it makes sense to help people pay that down payment. Now, the bankers had a brilliant idea. Bundle up the normal mortgages with the subprime ones and sell them to other banks, pension funds, hedge funds, and sovereign funds. Mortgage payments generated huge profits, and demand was high for this new type of speculative contract, now called collateralized debt obligations, or CDOs. This created the housing bubble. Uh, ben, there's been a lot of talk about a housing bubble, particularly you know, from the Fed, from all sorts of, of uh, uh, different places. Can you give us your view as to whether or not there is a housing bubble out there? Well, unquestionably, housing prices are up quite a bit. I think it's important to note that uh, fundamentals are also very strong. We've got a, a growing economy, uh, jobs, incomes. We've got very low mortgage rates. The experts appeared all over mainstream news, assuring everyone that housing was not a bubble. We could be on a big, fat bubble, and if that bubble crashes, it's a problem. The word bubble, remember the word bubble. You heard it here first. I mean, I don't want to sound rude, but I hope if it explodes, it's going to be now rather than two months into another administration. Because honestly, you got yourself problems. The word bubble, remember the word bubble. You heard it here first. Love him or hate him, there's one thing nobody can deny. Donald Trump knows a lot about the U.S. economy. He's part of the 1% running this country and has built a multi-billion dollar fortune. So, is the Republican frontrunner full of hot air again? Or is this a slip of the tongue from somebody who knows more than he's willing to share with the rest of us? The answer to this question will shock even hardcore liberals. My name is Charles Hayek, and I'm a retired economics professor. Most of my life, I've studied macroeconomics and the cycles of boom and bust in the global economy. What I can promise you right now is if you give me just 10 minutes of your time, you will understand more about our economy than many Harvard graduates. In my research, I have uncovered a strange pattern that has been going on for the past 20 years. A bizarre economic cycle intimately linked to every U.S. election since then. Right now, I will show you the hard facts that led me to this conclusion in plain and simple English, so that by the end of this video, you can make your own choice and be better prepared for what's to come. But to understand how this bizarre pattern works, we need to take a short look back at 1999. When the bowl drops on the year 2000, it will be a momentous event for the world and for the U.S. economy, which is closing in on its longest expansion ever. The decade has been marked by strong growth, the lowest unemployment in a generation, and yet remarkably little inflation. It seemed like a totally different America than the one we are living in today. The stock market was booming thanks to the Internet companies, affectionately called the dot-coms. For many Americans, investing in the Internet companies seemed like the quickest way to become rich. More and more people put their savings into the stock market, driving it higher and higher. They gambled their money on the hope that they could sell those stocks for two to three times their value. And everybody was praising the Clinton administration for creating the biggest economic growth in U.S. history. For a time, it worked. To many, it seemed like the party would never end. Even the chairman of the Federal Reserve, Alan Greenspan, said, Technology is creating a new economy, one where the old rules no longer applied. The Fed was so confident that in February 2000, it began raising the interest rates to their highest level since 1995. At the same time, bad economic data started to come in. The previous holiday season that was supposed to